Hey, 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 time to shine today. Varsity Squad, it is Scott Ferguson, and I have actually my first return guest. Um, very, very good friend of mine out of the great state of Texas. Um, he lives in the antique capital of the world there in Texas, and his name is George Henley. Um, he has the company, the Speakers Academy, and uh, back in February 18th, I interviewed George. Um, and I dropped his podcast. If you want to go back, it's episode 41. Um, and George was just fantastic with his knowledge nuggets that he dropped on us, uh, his visual, vocal, and verbal, his three Bs, um, you know, about honing your skills as a speaker. And we really dug in deep about who George is. And, uh, but now I want to give him a platform of telling us about the Speakers Academy. We touched on it a little bit, but I want to find out um, how he handled the quarantine, how he, you know, during, because right now we're in August and this might drop in a couple of weeks. So it might be even September before this episode actually drops, but you know, we're in quarantine. So we're not uh, totally in quarantine, but we're still kind of locked down a little bit until that November 3rd date. And then we'll see what happens. But um, I want to bring my good friend, George Henley on and just ask him how he's doing. The man is just a phenomenal go-giver. Um, he's put me in touch with people that I never probably would have reached out to consciously. Um, but I did pray for people like George to come into my life and God provides because God is good. So George, welcome back to the show, my friend. How are you? <laughs> It's, I mean, to know that I'm the first guy that is on a repeat. <laughs> I mean, are. my ego is kind of going. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have an ego, George. You really <laughs> do. do. It's really low-key, low key, though. So. I'll tell my wife that today, and she'll go, oh, that's nice, dear. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Right, so oh. February, February 18th, um, we were – um, still living life, you know, coming off yeah. the Super Bowl, you know, yeah. you know it's great. Um, your uh, episode dropped on March 4th, which was still uh, thir two weeks before quarantine really started on March 17th and 18th for most of the United States. But like, how did you, you know, as we were going into, we never really had a chance to discuss it, but you're still thriving during the quarantine time. Can you tell us a little bit about how that worked out for you? Yeah. So, you and I both know the principle of reciprocity uh, from a, a, a universal perspective. It's as you sow, so shall you reap. Right. And I had already begun to think in terms of uh, gifting myself, giving myself away. And so I, I, because I know that anytime I feel like there's any, even just a little clog in the works as far as things coming back my way, I need to increase my giving. Because I know the principle. I've lived the principle. I've seen things. I mean, I've just seen miracles happen in my life. Right. And God's been good to me. And, and every time I've given, I've always had a, a wonderful return on the gifts I've given. So I started literally a session, a Zoom session, four free Zoom sessions each week. It's called Me for Free, Ask Me Anything. Me for free, ask me anything. <clears throat> and on those Zoom sessions, I help people practice the skills that are so important in good communication, such as like right now, I'm trying to give you great eye connection and I'm trying to show you that I've got energy. So I'm gesturing and, and I'm, I'm looking at how we can connect with one another because all of these little things, Scott, make a big difference. So in my sessions, Every week, I, I pick, shall we say, a, a little principle, a little technique, a, a little piece of the bigger picture puzzle that will help them level up and take that next step upward. But the key issue, and this is something I've just driven home and driven home and driven home, the key issue is practice practice. Every session starts with a chance to practice. And they do one of two different kinds of practices. But bottom line, everybody practices, they get a little feedback from me as the coach, and they get peer feedback. And that practice and that positive feedback helps them just continue to step higher, 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 higher. And, and their game and their, their skill sets are growing. As an example, just yesterday, uh, on our practice session, on our, our Zoom session, uh, one lady who I've had as a new client for a while, 
I, I was, I, I quite frankly, I was blown away to <laughs> see how much she has improved in a short period of time. And I don't say that in any way to, to, you know, point the finger at me. I just say that I know the principles. You know the principles. If you go into the weight room once a year, you don't get nothing out of it except some sore muscles. If you go into the weight room once a month, you don't get nothing out of it except sore muscles. But if you're, you know, really, shall we say, religiously happy and go in there regularly, you get the benefits. It's the practice and then the coaching that makes you better and better, stronger and stronger. I love that. So, which is true, you know, repetition and reps, getting the reps in, is going to make you better. So I'm curious to know, you know, I, I've been blessed. I've, I've gotten some um, live uh, speaking gigs here in the past couple of weeks, you know, in, in different parts of the, the lower uh, Southern states here, speaking to real estate offices and whatnot. But when you're doing a lot, like, okay, when I practice on a daily basis, you know, George, like presentation. Um, but I just found like, how are you helping people like this lady you just spoke about? She practiced, practiced, and you're like blown away about how good she's gotten. How do you think that's going to translate when she kind of gets in front of 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 people? Well, bottom line, there's always going to be in the early stages, some nerves. There's, I mean, even for me, when I get back in front of a larger audience, one especially that I'm unfamiliar with, <laughs> I have to make sure that I kind of get my set, my head in the right place, in the right mindset. But when I, I know, I just think back on the years and years of work that I've done and everything that I've done to prepare for that moment in time. Then I think, hey, I've got decades of practice and experience. I'm just here to deliver. And it's not about me, Scott. It's never about me. It's about what can I do to give value to my listeners. That, that sure. one or 15 or 500 or 5,000 in the audience, what can I do to give them value today that they walk away and they go, I, I can apply that today. I can right. do something with that today. And that gives them hope. And, and Scott, you know, you know, right now, people are craving uh, connection. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're craving for the connection, but yeah. man, they're, they're looking for hope. They yeah. need hope merchants. They need people who can deliver a, a ray of sunshine, a little bit of hope for tomorrow and next week and the coming months. Love it. Love it. But when you're coaching these clients and you're doing it virtually, are you planting seeds that like, you know, cause I, I know that, you know, I love speaking. That, that's the thing I kind of get up <laughs> for it, man. And, and start showing up and showing out for it. But other people, it's like when they get in front of a crowd, they rather, they, they fear that more than death. You know, that cliche, they, they fear death <laughs> more than public speaking. Me, I love it. I mean, don't, t don't get me wrong. I am scared poopless. Like every time I go up there, but I feed off of it. You know, I've competed in bodybuilding competitions in my underwear in front of 2000 people. So I get, you know, what the eyes are on you and whatnot, but are you planting anything in them while you're doing the virtual training to get them ready for the crowd? Yeah. Well, uh, I just read something yesterday that just, you know, reconfirmed and substantiated something that I've known quite a while. And that's just basically this incredible picture of visualization. And I read a book, gosh, over 20 years ago. And the guy, Bob Conklin, who developed a course that was truly life-changing for me and millions of people around the globe, he wrote a book and, and had several chapters on visualization, verbalization, actualization. And as you visualize and as you verbalize, those things begin to sh take shape and form. I have a picture up here. On, you can't see it, but I've got a picture up here on my vision board. It's a vision board. And that vision is a picture of me visually standing in a river with a fly line out there and casting that fly out there to really lure those fish my direction. I have another picture above that. It's got this gnarly looking uh, wild hog and I'm going at, via an invitation from an old high school friend in early fall to hunt hogs. Hogs. So, right, right, right. I mean, so it's it, it, everything that we do, 
It may be just that quick, the snap of a finger, but everything that we do is a visualization. I was visualizing coming on the show with you today mm -hmm. and knowing that you and I have a great rapport and a great opportunity to converse and to, again, share something of value. So I help them visualize success before they actually see success in front of their group. I love that. Thank you for saying that. That's what I was kind of digging for. That's what I was going to hope you were going to say, because everything really is about visualization. Every time that I've competed in something or even now speaking, whether it's virtually or even just waking up, George, in the morning, <laughs> I'm visualizing through prayer, through my breathing exercises, through how, however you do it, I, I actually visualize my day. You know, and mm -hmm. I love that you have mm -hmm. those narcissistic pictures of yourself. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but I love that you have that because you are, you're, you're planting that seed. Even subconsciously, you see that. Even your unconscious brain sees it, even though you're not. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm going to lure. I'm going to do the right things to bring the right people in. I'm going to be the rock star on stage. I'm going to do that. So let's talk about the process at the Speakers Academy. So someone reaches sure. out to me and they're like, Scott, man, I need to level up my speaking, right? Um, and luckily, I have somebody that uh, has coached me since I was a young man, you know, in my, mm -hmm. in my 20s. Uh, but I really like you, and I like your uh, style, love your man of faith, and, but I want to refer someone to you. How's the process start to bring them sure. on as a client at the Speakers again? Sure. Well, first of all, I do a lot of um, assessment. And I do a lot of questioning. You know, you're very good at asking questions and drawing these kinds of things out of me as well as your other people that you're interviewing every single week. But it always starts with me learning more about them. Right. You, I think you remember my SAY formula. SAY stands for subject, audience, yourself. Absolutely. So the person that I'm coaching, they're my audience. And I must really get to know him or her. I get, I get, got to get to know them. I get to get to know their, their purpose, their passion, and how they want to profit from getting in on the stage and getting in front of people. I have a two page, very detailed 60 point assessment, 60 point assessment that they score themselves on before we ever really get going. And it gives me, and it gives them an idea of what they know as well as where they want to go. And, and the bottom line is that it's, it's humbling in many respects because for the most part, everybody is ranking themselves in what we'll call the mid range, knowing that they're not applying a lot of things that they could. And it's important for them to have a self assess It's just like you go to the doctor, and, and they say, how are you doing? But before they even get that conversation, they put you on the scale. They take your blood pressure. They do all of those yeah. assessments of right. you to see what they are seeing via their instruments and scale, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things are done because they never want to assume that you are the same you were from six months ago or a year ago to where you are today. So, so assessment we, is the first step. What do you do? Okay. I, I love it because I mean, even for my coaching program, George, it, it's almost 14 pages. I mean, I, I make sure that whoever comes into it is serious, right? Exactly. But what I put on the front, like th th I'm going to ask you this because it's very detailed 60 bullet points or 60 point inspection. Yeah. And I love the analogy you used about going into a doctor. They just go in and say, what's wrong? They take your vitals. And I love that. That's so true. It what? is what do you, do you diffuse there? Because what a lot of people will think when they see my, my intake is what I call it is, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, are you going to judge me from this? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like people sure. come in you in your detail with the 60 point, sure. you know, uh, what do you do to diffuse them to let them know that you're not judging them from what they're feeling out? Because again, let's go back to your analogy. You have you know, blood pressure of 160 over 110, you know, the doctor's just going to sometimes jerk doctors will come in and say, you need to do this and this and this. You know what I'm saying? They're prejudging. They don't look That's for right. a root cause. So what do you do to diffuse that? Yeah. Well, one of the first things I do is I say, you are just basically like everybody else. In other words, there's never been anybody who's scored themselves up on the higher echelon. <laughs> right. Not once. Right. And quite frankly, quite frankly, uh, if I'm honest on a day to day basis, I'm not sure that I could score myself up on the highest right. echelon. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of like, right. okay, 
but mm -hmm. but we have to understand where we're at today so that we know where we want to go tomorrow love it and 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 we just have to say okay this is a process of learning and you can't go beyond what you've been taught if you haven't been taught something nobody can expect you to know it hey right. You know, we're all dumb about one thing or another. I'm dumb about a lot of things. Me too. I'm here. <laughs> all right. That's right. Okay. But, but let's find out where we're at today so we know where we want to go and how we want to go in our progress together. Love it. I love it. So after they, they come in, what do you have, when the quarantine lifts, do you have in-person speaking courses and virtual or oh, how, does, oh, how yeah. does it work with you, George? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, everything right now is virtual just because of where we're at with the quarantine issue, but before and then after we'll get back into the face-to-face -face work, the, the, the group session work, because that's where I can really see mm -hmm. the most. Okay. Uh, like right now I've got a client and he's doing virtual work and you know, I can't really see him doing his virtual work. Well, it's, it's just a difficult situation. Sure. We're making great progress together, but it's not quite the same as watching him in front of a group and seeing him and how he handles himself and the group and the interaction thereof. So things will get much, much better and more balanced once the quarantine lifts and we can go back to the kind of things that I typically do in the sessions that I handle. Because the more I see them in and around other people, the more I pick up on a variety of little things that they're doing well. And I right. take note of that and the things that they can do to improve. And we take note of that and we look at and make sure they see and feel good about what they're doing and where they can continue to improve. Love it. And do you, do you, Mr. Miyagi them, do you kind of make sure they wax on wax off a lot of times before you like put them out to the wolves? I hate to use that term. You know, a lot of them, they're coming to you to yeah. be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, you give them guidance at the Speakers Academy to say, okay, find this and go try to speak there. Or yeah. like just, you know, me, I, that's what I did. I started with Toastmasters, right? You know, and then just worked my way up saying, I'll give free whatever to a real estate office that was outside of my competition zone. So I would drive, sure. this is when I lived in Detroit, from Detroit to Kalamazoo, which was like- A know, long way. You know, a little bit, it like took me an hour and 45 minutes to get there, but it was allowed me to get out of my pond and listen, because people will listen to somebody that they don't know more than they'll listen to people that they know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, so like, how, 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 what's your process with, you know, I call it miyagi and them, like getting them ready to know like, hey, they're going to the Hidden Valley karate tournament. You know what I'm saying? How yeah. to get to the stage. Yeah. What's your process so, of evaluation that? So one of the first things I try to make sure that they recognize is, some of the greatest advice I got from two of the icons in the speaking business. The very first National Speakers Association convention I went to, the very first luncheon during that convention, my sister who, who had been a member for already like 10 years, she says, let's go have lunch with Cabot. I'm going, and, and she's referring to Cabot Robert, who was the founder of the National Speakers Association. <laughs> right, and right. I'm kind of going, I'm kind of going, okay, right. sure. Yeah. So we go, and I'm literally sitting next to Cabot. Right. And, and his glasses need some help. So I help reconfigure, get his glasses back in shape and, and clean them up and hand them back to him. He looks at me, he says, Good job, son. Thank you for that. But the piece, the little jewel, the nugget that he gave me that day, and the nugget I heard later on from Zig Ziglar was very simply, speak at every occasion you can. It doesn't matter what size the group is. It doesn't matter whether or not, you know, you, you're getting paid. Get in front of every audience you can and speak and learn by the process. In other words, it's doing the reps. It's, it's getting the practice. And Scott, I lost count long ago of all the free presentations I've made to Rotary Clubs and, and Lions Clubs and NABO. I mean, every under association under the sun that I could get in front of, I got out and spoke. I mean, I literally had people 
flying me down to Houston and Lubbock and San Antonio to deliver free presentations years ago. Wow. It gave me practice. Yeah, man. And it gave me practice. And I was able to deliver something and watch the audience and how they responded. Love it. And the fact that they were inviting me after a while, I was like, okay, I, I guess I'm doing okay. And they're Got inviting it. me different places. And, and the thing that you talked about, <clears throat> I had a young lady, gosh, probably nine, 10 months ago. And she said, George, I'm thinking about doing a TED talk. And I said, wow. well, okay. And she said, um, you know, I, I just heard that that's really going to help you know, me and my speaking. I said, let me, <laughs> let me give you this piece. Let me give you this piece of advice. Before you ever consider walking on a TED stage, you've got to walk on at least 30 or 40 or 50 yes. other stages right. that are much smaller, that are much more low key, that are much less hazardous for your own EQ, for your own ego. Because right. if you get on a big stage and you fail, that will hurt you in a bad way. Yeah. So absolutely. you, you got to play in the little leagues yeah. before you get into the big leagues. You got to wax on and wax off reps, right? That's it. Get it done. That's it. Get it yeah, done. That's George, it. George, what do you use to get, like, I, I'm going to ask for a little secret sauce from the Speakers Academy right now. But yeah. what do you use a technique to, like, I've been that deer in the headlights before where I, I, I'm flowing, everything's good, then oh, crap. I forgot what I was going to say. Like, is there something that you use to help your <laughs> clients kind of get back on track? Yeah, I, I was. I can. I can remember it so vividly. I was over in Irving, Texas, which is part of the Mid Cities. I was invited, and I think it was a Rotary Club. I can't remember that for sure. But I had this, shall we say, a sort of a canned speech, and I had tried to memorize a lot of it, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, I learned along the way that didn't work well for me. But, <laughs> but I probably got about a third of the way into this thing, and all of a sudden, it was just like, what? Right. <laughs> and, and I was, I was the deer in the headlights. Literally. Yeah. It was like, uh Oh, where did it go? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so Scott, I've been there, done that. Sure. <clears throat> and, 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 and this is the thing I tell people, the audience can help you. And the way you can get the audience to help you is I've just covered a couple of points who would like to help the entire group by remembering and sharing those points that I've already covered with you. <laughs> and, and somebody will say, well, I'll do that. And they'll jump up. And while they're talking, you've got a chance to kind of search your mental file and find where you were and what you were trying to then move to the next point. Wow. And, and, and it, you just have to go, okay, I know it's there. I know it's there. I just have to have a, a moment to find that on the, the, the mental rerun. And right. you get your audience involved and they help you by way of taking the pressure and the spotlight off of you for a moment. And then you, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm good to go. Wow, that's solid. And, and, and it works and they help you. So. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't really let you go, George, without – you know, I didn't ask you this during our interview, but how do you want that dash remembered, man? That little line between your life date and expiration date. How do you want George Henley's dash remembered? That's a hard one. Yeah. <clears throat> We're time to shine today, baby. <laughs> you can take your time. You want to engage the audience here? I'll, I'll, I'll sell you something. You can get it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I love it. Uh, I've been wanting to ask you this, man, because you're such a go-giver. Um, I've learned from you just watching your, your, your posts and, and just everything you did for me. But how do you – because I, I look at you as like you're a living legacy, George. I mean, honestly, <laughs> man, I'm not trying to pump up that ego or whatnot so your wife can be like, that's nice, George. But, you know, yeah. just you know, like what do you, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, he served God to the best of his ability. Love it. Love it. And you gave, gave, gave too. So I'm going to add that in there for you. I'm going to add good. that in there for you. So, George, what's uh? I'm going to ask a little Casey Haston uh, question here. Oh, good. Our friend that left us off her plaque. If you're listening, <laughs> Casey. Um, uh, oh, Scott, she's going to love that. I know, right? You go. You're going. Uh, to, you're going to Mars. First colony. <laughs> what are three things you're taking with you? 
Let's, well, let's just say the Bible's already going. Your wife's already going. All right. Let's, let's give me three other things. Some fun stuff. <laughs> okay. Some fun stuff. Uh, I would take someone who has demonstrated the ability to live in that kind of foreign, somewhat <laughs> hostile environment. Like a survivor, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody. I love it. You know, you yeah. know, uh, because that's going to be a foreign, possibly very hostile environment. So I want somebody who has been there, done that sure. to kind of lead me by the hand. Right. Because I'm a follower. Before I'm a leader, I'm a follower. Let me go. follow your example. <laughs> I don't want to get out there and goof up and end up, you know, blowing myself up or something else. So I right. need somebody who's going to be there uh, sort of as a the leader. And then I'll follow and say, okay, good. I'll, I'll go that direction. Uh, beyond that, since I've already got my wife, since they've already got my Bible, uh, gosh, uh, that's, a, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things. I have a vast library and maybe I would be able to take a, um, uh, one of those, uh, um, locker books, Kindle, a Kindle. Oh, okay. With, with Kindle, like gotcha. Hundreds yeah. of hundreds of go. books there you go. Uh, on my Kindle so that I'd have great insight and things to be able to look at. Uh, and then I guess the other thing I'd take would be, an, an everlasting journal, meaning something that I could journal in and journal in and journal in Love forever. It. Love because it. Because I know the value of that value to me. And I think a lot of other people are seeing and understanding the value. So being able to take and record a few of my thoughts along the way and, and leave that for perhaps uh, my children, grandchildren, friends, etc., to benefit from. You left chicken so. wings out. Cause I'm taking chicken. <laughs> wings. You know, <laughs> Hey George. <laughs> What kind of last question here? What, what's, what's the one thing you know for sure? Oh, this is a good one. And I prepared for this one. <laughs> and knowing you, my friend, this one you'll love. All right. Scott, the one thing I know is no matter what the circumstances look like today or tomorrow or this week, this month, this year, no, this one thing I know, we win in the end. Wow. Love it. Scott, we win in the end. I don't care what the scoreboard says right now. We win in the end. We know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. That gives us hope. That gives us peace. That gives us great comfort. We win in the end, my friend. Love it. And love it. And squad, thank you for like tuning in to a, another awesome conversation with my really, really good friend, George Henley. <laughs> uh, humble beyond beyond words. <laughs> love, love this guy. Like uh, seriously, man, he, he's going to remind you to gift yourself to people, you know, and when you're kind of in the doldrums or whatnot, try to increase your giving, you know, um, you know, check him out. I have his website. It'll be in the show notes here, but uh, check him out or else I can put you in touch with George and maybe he, he might still be running the me for free. Um, maybe mm -hmm. you can kind of pop in and, and kind of check out what he's got going on. You should hire him if you're really looking to get on stage. He, he has a inch by inch, it's a cinch uh, mentality about your speaking. You know, by the yard, it's hard. He told the story about a woman wanting to get up on a TED or a TEDx stage. And he's like, man, just take it inch by inch. You know, it's going to work out because you don't want to fall on your face in front of a big crowd. Fall on your face in a lot of mini crowds. And if you're a speaker, an aspiring speaker, take every friggin' <laughs> opportunity that you have, even if it's to speak for free, you know, he reminded us about his say acronym of uh, subject audience and yourself. Um, he wants you to visualize and verbalize while you're practicing, put yourself in the situations of giving, giving, giving of the information while you're up on stage and visualize yourself there giving the best speech possible. And if you do run into a speed bump, Use George's advice of engage with your audience. If you forget you have that deer in the headlights, maybe reach out to the audience with a question to get them engaged and then work your mental Rolodex, mental filing system to kind of get you back. And he also will remember that no matter what the circumstances are, we will win in the end. And by God's grace, that will happen. So George, thank you so much, brother, for coming on. I can't wait to do it in 2021 again, if not before. And folks, reach out to me so I can put you in touch with George. He's humble. He's hungry. He levels up his health. He levels up his wealth. And he'll always be part of our varsity squad. So again, thanks, George. Thank you, Scott. What a pleasure to be with you today. Awesome. Have a great day, my friend. Bye thank now. Thank you.